Mark 9, verse 14. Now, let's just put this in context, just in case anybody watching or here tonight hasn't been reading along with us. Jesus has fed 5,000 plus women and children with a little sack of lunch. He's fed 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish. He took spit and put it on a man's tongue that couldn't talk, got the guy healed. He took spit and put it, put it on a man's eyes, and he was healed. So these guys have been seeing miracles, participating in miracles, not just watching them, but participating in them, right? So now in verse 14, And when Jesus came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. You ever read that verse before? You have now. So they're having a dispute. That's not uncommon when we read about the scribes of the Pharisees. They often were somewhat confrontational. Now, the scribes were known for knowing the Scriptures because they were scribes of it. They're the ones who made sure that the Scriptures on the parchment were translated to the next parchment exactly the way they were on the previous par parchment. You didn't add a space, a comma, an emphasis. You added nothing. Their job was to write it exactly the way it had been written originally by the Holy Ghost. So they were very knowledgeable, very intellectual. And they're arguing with the disciples. Now, so we got these religious intellectuals, and I'm not knocking that they're smart, and I'm not saying they weren't spiritual in any way. They're the scribes. They're Jews. They're covenant people. But who are they disputing with? Fishermen? Tax collectors? Acts says that they took note of the disciples, that they had been with Jesus. Well, that didn't impress the scribes. <laughs> and so they're having a dispute. I wonder what they're arguing about. Well, let's just find out maybe, maybe just maybe what the dispute is. I suspect they're having somewhat of a theological discussion about demonology. <laughs> Have you ever had a discussion with a theologian about demons? <laughs> no, I don't even want to talk about that. Just pass the coffee and the donuts, bless the Lord, amen. And it says, and they were disputing with the scribes, and the scribes were disputing with them. And immediately when they saw Jesus, all the people were greatly amazed and ran to greet him. Oh, it's Jesus. Oh, great day in the morning. It's Jesus. That's pretty exciting. And he really kind of ignored the crowd for a moment because he sees there's a dispute. How many of you would agree if there's a dispute, there's probably some differences of opinion? Okay, you didn't raise your hand, so obviously you have a difference of opinion. How many of you know we all have opinions? I was told many years ago, opinions are like noses and everyone has one. And I said, yes, my opinion's like my nose. I have a big one. Keep your opinion to yourself. Anyway. And how many times have we joked, you know, everyone has a right to their opinion and they have a right to be wrong. And he said, uh, what are y'all discussing with them? He asked the scribes, what are y'all discussing what are y'all having this dispute about and immediately one in the crowd answered and said teacher I brought my son to you who has a mute spirit and whenever it seizes him it throws him in throws him down he foams in the mouth gnashes at his teeth he becomes rigid so I spoke to your disciples that they could cast it out how many of you know this story they couldn't cast that devil out so why are they having an argument why are they disputing with the scribes because the scribes know the, the old covenant and the disciples are like, well, we're supposed to be able to do this. <laughs> that demon's supposed to come out. How come that demon coming out? And the scribes are like, well, I can tell you how come. Because you're a bunch of unlearned idiots. You're not one of us. You're not special. You don't know the word like we know the word. You've just been hanging around with Jesus. Maybe that's what they were arguing about. Because we know that as soon as Jesus said, what are y'all discussing? The man says, hey, master. And we find out as a result that this son has had a demon from childhood and the disciples couldn't cast the devil out, yet they're disputing and having a dissertation. In today's vernacular, they're having a conversation. You know, we just need to have a conversation. And when he says, what are y'all discussing? The man immediately responds. Well, I have a need. So let me back up to my point now. Point number one, a real, real simple point, more difficult to translate into human experience in a positive way. 
our differences. Look around the room. Ladies, how many of you hate it when you show up with that favorite dress or outfit on and you look across the room and somebody's got it on too? You're like, i got to get my throw over, my pull over, my whatever over. We're all very different, but our differences easily distract us from focusing on the main thing. What's the main thing? Love God and love others as we love ourselves. That's really what the gospel is all about. Because if you don't love people like they love you, you won't care if they go to hell. You won't care if they walk in truth. You won't care if they're living a destructive lifestyle. And immediately the guy says, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Second point. I'm already on point number two. You ready? People's unmet needs, often unspoken, but in this case not, people's unmet needs are the main thing to them. <laughs> uh, we say it like this, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What do I get out of being here tonight? What do I get out of serving the Lord? Just go over to Malachi chapter 3 when it talks about giving. And God said, I've heard the harsh words you said about me. We do all this and what's in it for me? Now, that's a paraphrase. You read it. Malachi 3, 10, 11, 12, 13. But God said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Amen. What's in it for me? That's, that's somewhat a human or a natural, and natural is not always good. Natural man, carnal man, spiritual man, natural is not always good. That's how we all start, though. People's unmet needs are often the main thing to them and should be to us, too. Have you ever come to church <laughs> with a need, but you had camouflaged it? But yet at the same time, while the preacher's preaching and the singers are singing, not necessarily in that order, you're thinking about your need and you're thinking about your need, the need you have, that lack, that hurt, that discouragement. You ever, has that ever happened to you? And you're really, and, and that's natural, it's normal. And in so doing, not conscious that the person you walk past or even they're sitting near has one too. And you never thought about it because you're thinking, why didn't they say something to me? How come they didn't notice? Well, how come you didn't? See, because our unmet needs oftentimes are really important to us. And so when Jesus, they bring, he brings his son to the disciples, obviously thinking Jesus was there with them at the moment, and he wasn't. But as soon as Jesus walks up trying to figure out, why are y'all disputing? What, what's the division? What, what's going on here? The man immediately says, Jesus is here. I don't care about y'all's argument. I want my need met. My son, my child is important to me. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Arkansas Christian Academy and I want to strongly encourage you to visit our website or call us and take a tour of ACA. You know, over the past four years, our graduating seniors have received over $1.3 million in college scholarships. We're a fully accredited faith-based Christian school and in this environment in our world, you need to strongly consider Arkansas Christian Academy. Take a tour, make a phone call, visit our website. We'd love to visit you right here at ACA. God bless. So he, he says, uh, my son has this mute spirit. And whenever it, everybody say it, stop. The Holy Spirit is never referred to as it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is a he. He is not a non-gender. We do know he is a spirit, but we do know in Scripture he is referred to as a person, the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not it. The Holy Spirit is he. Amen. The devil, he and it. And sometimes he and it pretends to be a she. 
even though that's a gender and demons may really not have a gender no more than God really has gender as we humans know gender. But he says this spirit, it seizes him and it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and he gnashes. So I spoke to your disciples and they couldn't cast him out. And Jesus then responds. Let's see my point here. Our differences distract. People's unmet needs are their main thing and should be ours too. But this guy says, Jesus, I brought the disciples to him. Let me put it this way. Is this too personal? I brought my child to church and ain't nobody there cared enough or knew how or had enough anointing to get him or her free. And Jesus responds, yep, well, I'm the goat. I'm the only one that can pull that off. No, that's not what he does. You know what he does immediately? And this is where Christians get offended if you're not humble enough to be instructed by the Holy Ghost from the Scriptures. He looks at him and says, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? <laughs> how long shall I bear with you? Isn't that what you want Jesus to say to you? <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> How long I could put up with you? Why don't you have faith? I want him to say, well done. Not go over there and tell you well done. How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Say this with me. I may not be able to do everything. But I can stay true to the main thing. Some of you will never, ever cast out a devil. Some of you may just be in a situation where you just never have somebody foaming at the mouth and falling out in the floor and falling in the water or falling in a fire. You may never, thank the Lord, have to cast out a devil. But how many of you can do, with God's strength and grace and mercy, do the main thing? Love God and love people as yourself, and take those people that maybe you're, you're not at that place where you can cast out the devil or you can believe God for something that God would do supernaturally through a human vessel, but you can bring them to Jesus. Jesus said, bring him to me. He said, oh, gosh. I just, I just kind of get tickled at Jesus because I know he's never, ever felt that way about me. But you know what's beautiful about Jesus? He never, ever kicks us to the curb. He never gives up on us. He addresses us. He may exhort us. But point number three, already point number three. Jesus didn't give up on people because they didn't always do the main thing. Now, if they couldn't have cast out this devil, if they couldn't have, if they couldn't have been prepared spiritually to do it, then why would he talk to them that way? All right, I'm going to fast forward to the end of this gospel. These signs shall follow them that believe. How many times have I said how many believers we have in here? These signs shall follow who? Them that the believe. He didn't say to you 12 disciples or 11 at this point because Matthias hadn't replaced Judas. He didn't look at it and say, these signs are going to follow you 11. He said, these signs are going to follow those that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. Who's going to cast out devils? Those that believe. Here he has his disciples walking with him, talking with him, and they can't cast out a devil. So he says, oh, you faithless generation. But now he didn't kick them to the curb. He just spoke to them, and he spoke about an area in their life that they needed to spend time in the presence of the Lord to get it right so they could be more effective in doing the main thing, which is loving God, loving people, and bringing hope and deliverance into their life. And I find this very fascinating, that he didn't give up on them. And so then they brought this young child to Jesus, and when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Now his dad already said to Jesus, this is what happens. But I want you to also notice, as soon as that spirit got the presence of Jesus, 
he started manifesting. He sees that child immediately. Created a scene because all the people are there like, what in the goodness gracious? Now what's happening in verse 20? The child is on the ground, foaming at the mouth and convulsing. Sounds like a crisis, doesn't it? If that's your child, that's a crisis. If you've never seen anything like that, that'd be a crisis. Is that a crisis? Watch Jesus. Watch him panic. So he asked the father. He's foaming, flipping around on the ground. Uh, how long has he been this way? He's, he's not even freaking out. Most everybody in this room, if that were to happen in your presence, you'd be like, where's pastor? <laughs> Somebody go get pastor quick. Somebody call 911. Come on, quick. Jesus doesn't panic at all. He just, the boy's on, the child, I'm, I'm saying he's a boy, he's, he's there. And Jesus just turns to the father and said, well, how long has he been like this? He said, well, from childhood. And often it throws him into the fire and the water to kill him. Now watch what the guy says. And before I finish verse 22, point number three, never panicking is essential if you're going to remain focused on the main thing. Because crisis is to distract you from the main thing. Because you can't do the main thing if you're not connected to the main man. And so crisis, traumatic events, diagnoses, distractions, and differences are all a tool of the devil to get you to panic. And what is panic? <laughs> Fear. What if something don't happen? What if God doesn't come through? It's the manifestation, literally a physical manifestation of being taken over by the spirit of fear. And you have not been given the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power. Dunamis, dynamite, Holy Ghost, power. And I promise you, you got somebody foaming and jerking on the ground or in the water or in a fire, you need the power of God. Jesus said, you foolish generation, what am I supposed to do to you? And the man looked at Jesus. And I know nobody that's watching, nobody that's here tonight is possibly has ever said anything like this. God, Jesus, if... If you can, does that sound like faith? Now watch what Jesus does. I love these stories, don't you? Amen. Don't you love it when I tell you these stories? But if you can do it, he's talking to Jesus. The whole multitude's there. He's brought the child to Jesus. The disciples couldn't do anything, but Jesus is there. And as soon as Jesus showed up and said, what's your arm? He said, hey, my son over here. But then he looks at Jesus and said, but... But if you can, but if you can, do anything. Wait a minute. Of course Jesus can do anything. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Second Chance Youth Ranch TV on Victory Television Network. And I'd like to invite you personally to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as we look at the need for fostering, adoption, and mentoring. And what a great opportunity you have to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. right here on Victory Television Network and I look forward to seeing you. He said, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now watch what Jesus says. Verse 23, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. Now the guy had to have some belief because he brought the child where he thought Jesus was. And when Jesus showed up, he interrupted the, the differences and the disputations and said, Hey, Master, they couldn't cast this devil out. So he must have had some belief or he wouldn't have taken his son out in public. But Jesus turned it around and he said, this is not about if I can. This is about if you can believe. All things are possible to him that believes. Well, the guy responded appropriately. Lord, 
I do believe. He did believe because he brought the son to him. But he recognized he was not in full convinced belief. I'm fully persuaded, Romans chapter 8. He said, Jesus, if you can. Jesus said, no, it's not if I can. It's if you can believe, then you can. And if you can believe it, I can. He said, well, help me, help my unbelief. That's why I teach the Bible here. Because the only cure for unbelief is the revelation of the Word of God. As God's will for you. Not God's will for just 2,000 years ago or God's will in heaven sometime later. It's the will of God for you. Now. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it. Everybody say it. He spoke to the spirit. The boys are on the floor. He's in a miserable condition. He's now ministered to the guy, getting him to focus not if I can, but if you're willing to believe I can, I will. And the guy, all of a sudden, he rebukes the spirit. He said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you. He spoke to the spirit. We talk about them. Not too many people willing to talk to them in Jesus' name. And many that tried, seven of them in the book of Acts 19, they ran away naked. I think Ray Stevens wrote a song about them. They call them the street. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. The Bible says in Matthew 12, 37, when a spirit goes out of a person, it goes out into dry places. When the Jesus confronted those spirits in legion, they said, please don't send us out into the abyss. Send us into those pigs. Spirits want a body to manifest in. Jesus came to set the captives free. And he said, come out of him and don't ever come back. And the spirit cried out. That, you want me, you want me to mimic that for you? <laughs> Give you goosebumps, make the hair back on your back of your neck stand up. Make the hair on this little fuzzy spot right stand right up. Just, oh. The devil, man, he's a, he's a freak. The spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly. So now what was manifesting is really writhing and carrying on. And came out. He cried out, convulsed him, and came out. And the young boy is just exhausted. If you've ever seen anybody go through deliverance, after they are completely delivered, they are so weak, they're like a little baby. They're just completely wrung out. Now, this is demon possession here that's taking place. This is not just some oppressive spirit. And the boy laid there like he was dead. And it says they thought he was dead. They went, boy, Jesus blew it, man. He killed a kid. But Jesus, mm, mm, boy, if I had an organ player up here tonight. But Jesus took the little boy by the hand. Remember that Tabitha? Arise. He took him by the hand and helped him up. The gate beautiful, Peter and John, not Jesus, Peter and John, Acts chapter 3. Alms for the poor. They said, ah, you don't need money. They took him by the hand and lifted, said, In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Silver and gold have I none. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And so they lifted him immediately. His ankle bones received strength. And he stood and he began to leap and praise God. Revival broke out for those who were willing to receive it. The other folks it made them mad. <laughs> he took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into his house, his disciples said privately, Hey, Jesus. Hey, Pastor. <laughs> hey, Jesus. That was really embarrassing. We tried to cast out that devil. We couldn't do it. Then the scribes showed up, and they were being all intellectual about it, and the people were listening. Why couldn't, why couldn't we cast out that devil? Point number four, the Word of God is vital if we lack spiritual insight or power to do the main thing. It's the Word. But now, let's be honest. The Word killeth. The letter killeth. But where the revelation of God's Spirit couples with the Word comes alive so he taught them he didn't give up on them he corrected them but then he sat down privately away from the crowd and he taught them 
The hunger in our lives must be to remain humble enough to remain teachable. He said, they're going to kill me, verse 32, but they didn't understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask. <laughs> okay, enough of that. He'd been teaching us. I'm not going to ask. You're not going to ask, are you? John, you're not going to ask? I'm not going to ask. James, you? Huh? Thomas, you? I doubt it. Now look at verse 45 of Luke 24. Revelation and understanding of Scripture is not head knowledge. It does include head knowledge. You can remember what God revealed to you, but it's revelation knowledge. Luke 24, 45. After Jesus was crucified, it says, He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Anything that you know about God that is truth and revolutionary and life-changing and transformative is because God in His great mercy showed it to you. We cannot stay true to the main thing if we're determined to do our own thing. The main thing is God's thing. And what is God's thing? Love Him and love others. And get under the spout when the glory comes out. Let him drive out all fear, intimidation, and doubt. And fill us with the glory of God so that when we are in the midst of a need and nobody can do anything but Jesus, we have tapped into his precious power and Holy Spirit for his honor and glory and to bring deliverance to the captives. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Why is that important? Because it says in 1 Peter, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Man, if ever anybody needed grace, it's us. How do we get it? By remaining humble. God, we need you. Lord, I don't want to be seen or heard. I just want to be used. Let you be glorified. And if you would be gracious enough to pour your power into my life, I'd be humbled. And to be used by you. Billy sent me a text the other day about how exciting it is to see what God's doing and thank me for what I do. And my response is, I'm just humbled to be a part of what God's doing. What an honor and a privilege in this end day to be a part of the body of Christ, to be used of God, to pray for people, to love the unlovable whether they love you back or not. 